It's Mike Mutzel and Bettina Newman. We're so glad that you're with us. We're going to talk all about the vascular system today with Dr. Victor Karswood. He's board certified in family practice management of internal disorders and clinical nutrition. He's well known for his public lectures on a wide variety of topics, and he's a frequent co-host of People's Radio Show in Austin, Texas. And uh, we've did a trial run this earlier today and his presentation rocks. You guys are in for a real treat. But want to let you know about some upcoming stuff. We're going to take a break next week, so we're not going to be doing any webinars. So uh, have the night off. But the Wednesday after that, I believe it's October 1st, we're going to talk all about GI disorders with uh, uh, one of our ramen churro suppliers. So we're going to have him on on Wednesday the 1st. So hopefully you can join us, same time, same place, and put that in your notebook. So with that, Dr. Victor, I will let you take it away. Thanks, Mike. Tonight's uh, topic is 21st Century Breakthroughs in Vein Health and Circulatory Function. Mike's got an infinitely snazzier title than I do. Mine's merely Vascular Integrity and Applications in Clinical Vascular Support. And I, I guess the reason I left the 21st century off of that is that a lot of this research was actually, actually done in the 20th century, so I can't say too much of this was uh, in the last 10 years. And a lot of this stuff is kind of basics, um, in case some of you have forgotten it or maybe you forgot how to apply this. So without further ado, let's kind of run forward and kind of see what the next hour brings to us. I'll try to wrap things up within an hour because I know a lot of you have a lot of uh, important things to do. I appreciate your time this evening spending with us trying to increase your uh, clinical knowledge and hopefully there's a few clinical pearls that will increase your uh, efficacy to your patients as time goes on. Who am I? Uh, my name is Dr. Victor Karjard. I'm a board certified chiropractic internist and clinical nutritionist. Uh, for the, those of you who are chiropractors out there, yes we do have boards of specialty and I do suggest that if you haven't gotten further training, look into those boards. They're great sources for additional information. Uh, my doctorate of chiropractic from TCC in, in uh, Texas. My uh, Master's degree is in human biochemistry and genetics. I did spend 15 years as a human gene therapist uh, before I got into alternative medicine. I got that degree at UTMB in Galveston. And my private practice is at an integrated compounding pharmacy here in Austin, Texas called Peoples. Uh, if you want to come out and check us out, um, and I'm usually on the radios when I'm not doing something like this. Uh, on the weekends, I'm doing postgraduate lecturing, lecturing for Texas chiropractic education um, and occasionally for companies like Zymogen. Uh, and I'm former adjunct faculty at the Academy of Oriental Medicine here in Austin, Texas. Um, I say this mostly to say that, look, I come from this from a wide variety of standpoints. I'm not a, uh, my education doesn't come from a single standpoint. And likewise, docs, I'm hoping that uh, you're using every tool in your cool toolkit to get your patients better. Don't rely on a single source. Don't rely on uh, a single distributor or, or even a single source of information. Make sure that you're getting all the information that you can. Um, the more information you've got out there, the more well-rounded a practitioner you're going to be. Um, I'm not a Zymogen employee. Um, I think at this point I'd probably ruin the staff picnics. Um, I am a Zymogen customer. I've been using their stuff for a number of years, um, and they will throw me a couple of peanuts out of their bag uh, for giving you this talk tonight. Um, so we're going to start off with a very basic idea. Now, um, discover the root cause. Apply the proper remedy. That is the way of the wise. Now, whether that's uh, that or, as they said in the Emperor's Yellow Classic, to uh, discover the source of the disease before it's fully manifest, the idea that we're trying to get for push forward here tonight is the idea that if you find the cause, the underlying source behind a lot of these disorders, um, you can stop a lot of these issues before they manifest into larger and larger issues for your patients. Um, so try to keep that in the back of your mind as we move forward. Um, one of the major issues we've got right now is the fact that is vascular integrity. Um, for a lot of cardiovascular ailments out there, by the time they see a conventional cardiologist, they're already well on their way toward having um, some severe inflammation and, and problems in, their, in the integrity of their vasculature. Um, if we are looking at this from a more functional standpoint, the idea is to get, get to them before they start developing these symptoms. Poor circulation, um, high blood pressure, hardening of the arteries, um, uh, various aneurysms, chronic, uh, chronic venous insufficiency, um, he, ulcers that won't heal, whether that's uh, uh, venous or otherwise, uh, hemorrhoids, spider veins, I and mean, certainly even in those of you that are not doing a lot of internal med, uh, you're going to see those patients walk in that if they're not complaining about anything else, trust me, you got a lady over 40 who's got spider veins or varicose veins showing up on her legs, she's going to want to get those taken care of. So from more complicated things all the way down to more simplistic things, you're seeing these patients literally walk into your office every day. Um, I, can, I will put the challenge forward to you that if you haven't already, when you see your next patients walk in tomorrow morning, um, take a look at them. I can guarantee within the first four or five you're going to see somebody that fits into this category regardless of how farther down that road they've gotten. So I pushed the right button. Now, 
we're going to start with the basic integrity of the cardiovascular system itself and work our way out from there. Obviously, there are going to be side caveats we could take into other manifestations of, of uh, disease states or path pathological states. Uh, pathological states, we're not going to go down that uh, quite yet. Um, let's start with some basics. Um, now, in the cross-sectional anatomy of both the arteries and the veins, you're dealing with a multi-layer uh, multi system. Uh, tunica externa, uh, wrapping the tunica media, the smooth muscle underneath, the layer of elastin underneath that, and the tunica intima in the, in the, in the middle. Um, a binding uh, a, a, a theme throughout all of these is the fact that both the tunica externa, the intima, and the elastin layer between them um, all have a high amount of collagen to them. So much like the rubber in an inner tube or a tire, that collagen serves as a fundamental part of the underlying integrity of, the vas of that vascular tissue. Um, sometimes when we run ahead and we start seeing patients with elevated cholesterol, we've got blockages in the arteries, we've got inflammation, um, we're so easy and we're so quick to run ahead toward dealing with those symptoms that sometimes we lose the, lose the idea that there's an underlying structure function relationship going on that we need to be able to in, to enhance the underlying structure of this of this vascular tissue um, as well as dealing with whatever other symptomologies or pathologies that may be dealing with underneath this. However, before we begin, we're going to do a brief historical perspective. Um, one of my undergraduate degrees was in history, so I always kind of like putting these things in, in the, a degree of, uh, of reference. So we're going to start talking about scurvy. Now, here I can hear the mental breaks go on. You kind of say, what? Where is he going? Bear with me, folks. It's all out there. So back in 1593, they first started noticing that uh, scurvy, which had pretty much uh, ravaged the, the, the Royal Navy, um, could be offset by the addition of some very, you know, very simple remedies. In this case, um, Richard Haw Hawkins noted that this sickness is uh, seen most fruitful for the sickness, the sour oranges and lemons. Um, Couple of four years later, John Woodall, the juice of lemons is precious medicine and well tried, being sound and good, is taken each morning two or three spoonfuls. Um, of course, operating on a standard government time frame, it took them nearly another 200 years before they actually turned around and said, you know what, maybe we ought to start doing this. Meanwhile, two million of their sailors had died. Well, what do they die from? Scurvy. Well, stop and think about it. Scurvy was a bleeding disease. As the vasculature lost its integrity, um, sailors would bleed out. You'd have bleeding from the skin, from the orifices, the eyes, etc. It was an excruciating death. Um, this occurred predominantly because a diet completely lacking in vitamin C led to a breakdown in the vascular integrity itself. Now, we don't have that situation where a lot of people are getting scurvy now. We've got at least baseline amounts of vitamin C. Um, but the 500 milligrams that's recommended according to the RDA is barely enough to keep the teeth in your head. It'll offset scurvy, but it won't necessarily keep you from having a global reduced level of vitamin C or vitamin C deficiency in a subclinical setting. Um, so what do pirates <laughs> that elk have to do with cardiovascular disease? Well, let's go back to that original slide. Each of those layers of the vascular system require collagen for their structure and integrity. Now, Vitamin C is the essential component of that. There are several others, and vitamin C basically serves to link lysine residues together between the alpha helices to form the fibrils that make up under uh, that make up collagen itself. Um, basically, it's the glue that holds the small little bits together. Um, lysine is bound to proline. That vitamin C then allows that that binding residue to be built together into larger and larger forms. Without that vitamin C, lysine residues are hanging out there unbounded, uh, and your collagen falls apart. Well, if that collagen happens to be making up your cardiovascular system, you can easily see how larger and larger gaps start occurring within the vascular uh, vascular makeup itself. Um, now, this seems like pretty rudimentary stuff. We all learned about vitamin C in, in school. We sat down and probably slept through a good chunk of those lectures. But what it boils down to it is going back to the basics, the idea that vitamin C in a therapeutic dose is essential to uh, is essential to the structure and function of the cardiovascular system. Um, now, by the way, as a brief side note, and I'm good at these dovetailings. Let me bring it back to you. Vitamin C was, dis C was discovered in 1932 uh, by, university, by uh, a researcher at the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Waugh, uh, and Dr. Albert Sensiorgi, uh, whose name I'm probably butchering, in, in Hungary. An interesting sing little side note, Dr. Georgi's protege was Dr. Do Dr. Maite Hidvegi, who I've had the pleasure of meeting. Um, he's actually pioneered work in cancer support, and if you, if you really want to follow that to its logical extent, um, as you start work working your way through uh, vitamin C and its usage and, and supporting oncogenesis, 
cardiogenic uh, patients. So vitamin C has been used. I mean, as as we we moved on from the early 30s, um, there have been hundreds of studies using vitamin C as a fundamental agent to rebuild the cardiovascular system. Um, we've kind of lost track of it as we've gotten uh, more and more powerful pharmaceuticals, as uh, we found more and more interesting things to 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 you know chase down but the fundamentals of vitamin C I think in a lot of patients and particularly when I review their uh, their protocols given to them by other providers um, some of these basics sometimes were overlooked particularly at therapeutic dosages 1953 um, according to the American Medical Association oh the Canadian excuse me Canadian Medical Association hello to my brothers up north uh, massive doses of vitamin C may be of therapeutic value in the treatment of atherosclerosis okay we've known this um, vitamin C along with vitamin E or fat soluble antioxidant um, are principal components of the glycosaminoglycans, that's right, the GAGs, um, that are the cement that hold together the inner lining of the vascular system. Um, and there are several papers that that all link this together. The upshot behind this is that although the data keeps piling up over the years, vitamin C is still not getting the essential um, the essential cornerstone that it needs in a lot of uh, in a lot of practitioners' uh, approach toward cardiovascular support. Now, um, as I mentioned before, another part of this vitamin C is lysine. Um, Vitamin C takes the lysine and helps the lysine residues bind together to make that helix, uh, to make the helix of fibrils that makes up collagen in the first place. Um, if those lysine, uh, those lysine residues are not bound together, they're basically free floating and they are a binding site that allows something else to bind instead. Um, it was discovered, um, according to Dr. Michael Brown and Dr. Joseph Goldstein uh, here in Texas at the UT Southwestern Med Center up in Dallas, um, they found that these binding sites actually bind something called LP little a, or lipoprotein A. Um, this is considerably worse than just LDL cholesterol. So let me take a brief side note off, to this, uh, off for a moment. Docs, if you've if you're dealing with patients and you're helping with them with cardiovascular support um, and you're measuring their cholesterol, if you have not started measuring on a regular basis uh, lipoprotein A, this is really something that diagnostically you're going to find uh, a huge benefit in your patients. Um, this week alone, I found three or four cases of people who had extremely high high levels of this LPA um, that hadn't been priorly noted. Their cholesterol levels had been fine, um, and they continued to develop plaques. Um, this happens to be the reason. Now, why? Because lipoprotein A is a variation of low-density lipoprotein. Um, it kind of looks like basic LDL. It's got a, your standard uh, cholesterol core with a little bit of uh, a little bit of protein around it, that ApoB. Uh, but in this case, in LPA, it's got some ApoA, another protein attached to it on the on the end, and that that ApoA resembles very closely fibrinogen uh, or fibrin, excuse me, the molecule that actually helps you clot. Um, so essentially, what you've got is a a core of cholesterol wrapped in Velcro. Um, the A in this case is actually for adherent because it's a super sticky form of it. Um, there are some studies out there that have actually shown that LPA has been as much as 10 times as atherogenic as conventional LDL on uh, on conventional blood tests. So what I'm saying is if you haven't checked this out this already, this is something that you fundamentally need to look at. Now, why is the body producing this LPA in the first place? Because it's not normally elevated. Well, it's doing it because the body thinks that it's using it to try to offset a deficiency in vitamin C. This is according to work given to us by Dr. Linus Pauling, who won the Nobel Prize for this. Um, he and his collaborator, Dr. Rath, um, basically have uh, their series of papers, and I mentioned a few of them here from the PNAS, but uh, they have... Uh, 20 or 30 papers on the utilization of vitamin C to reduce this. Basically, the body, when it doesn't have enough vitamin C to link these lysine residues together, produces um, LPA, okay, this very sticky form of LDL, which then binds to those lysine binding sites um, on the exposed collagen and starts the beginnings of the, the, the buildup of these plaques, at least according to their theories. Um, and there's a lot of evidence in the literature, certainly in Dr. Pauling and Dr. Rath's work, that substantiates this. So kind of summarizing what I've said in the last couple of minutes, the take-home from this is that if you're not using vitamin C and therapeutic dosages as a fundamental building block um, to rebuild the integrity of the structure of the cardiovascular system itself, you're missing an essential part of what you need to be 
be doing to support these patients. I admit, vitamin C is not a very sexy product. I mean, you say you're putting somebody on vitamin C and they're expecting to see something, you know, unique that they'd never heard of with a name that you could win a Scrabble game with. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be all that complicated. And certainly in those patients that are more resistant, you'll find that starting off with something as simple as vitamin C sometimes can be a very um, easy way to get some very fundamental effects. The problem, again, with most vitamin C uh, dosages that people are following the uh, following the RDA guidelines, and we all know what RDA stands for, and that's rats, drugs, and assumptions. Um, there's no real data that bears out the idea that 500 milligrams is actually enough to get you where you need to be. It's enough to keep you from getting scurvy, but it doesn't keep you from having elevated LPA. It's certainly not enough to keep your cardiovascular system intact. Before we move on, and I don't want to interrupt you, um, I apologize, but this is so powerful, and this is a common question that we get all the time. What do you do for elevated LP little a? Can you just quickly go over that in 20 seconds? Vitamin C deficiency leads to increased okay. LP little a, and then specific dosing, because I'm sitting here writing fast, and I can't write down as fast as you're talking, <laughs> and I know there's other people that are thinking don't the same worry. thing. So let's I've just got, that real quick. I've got dosage later, and actually vitamin C is very difficult to answer that question about, and I'll talk about the dosage you need for vitamin C. The things you do for LP little a, and that's kind of where I'm glad you asked this question because it boils now, down into this. So what do you do for LP little a? There are there are lots of things on an extended protocol. The basics that you need are a therapeutic dose of vitamin C. I'll go into how you check that individually for every patient in a second. A therapeutic dose of lysine. And now why? Because this dies into this, into this slide here. Because lysine free floating not only helps your body generate more collagen, it also acts as a sort of a suicide substrate for all that LP little a circulating in your system. You want enough circulating lysines to bind up the LP little a and help flush it out of your system before it adheres to the lysine, the exposed lysine residues in the vascular wall. Um, if you look at Pauling's work, he usually suggests somewhere between uh, he usually suggests between a gram and a gram and a half of lysine a day, um, going up significantly from there depending upon patient tolerance. Um, I've usually found that when dosing my patients with, with lysine, I generally want to start them at 500 milligrams and move them up to, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams from there. Um, if you move them up too quickly, some patients can have a, a little bit of an odd feeling as a result of a high dose of lysine. Um, another advantage, by the way, is that lysine also is a great inhibitor of some viral uh, viral infection, so you do get some, some side benefits from that. Um, so as this slide says, back in 89, uh, lysine binds to free-floating LP little a in the blood, okay? Prevents it from binding the, to the binding sites on the damaged artery, flushes it out of the body. Um, Commissioner report, uh, secondary report from Godzilla's Gronau uh, back in 89. Lysine binds to the lysine binding sites exposed by the damaged artery, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the third thing that I'll mention, and this is this is kind of part of this protocol, but not, not exclusively, um, is niacin. Um, I'm not going to go into a great detail on this, but niacin is one of those, you've got to get the levels up. I haven't seen, I haven't seen LP little a drop until I managed to get up lysine levels at least to a gram to a gram and a half a day. Um, you've really got to, you, but the combination of vitamin C, the lysine, and the niacin are kind of a foundation. And there's, there's lots of other combinations you can throw on top of this. Certainly anti-inflammatory enzymes, you can put turmeric, there's uh, green tea, resveratrol, um, of course, uh, omega-3 fatty acids. I mean, there, there are lots of things you can do as anti-inflammatories to, to build on this protocol. And I think every practitioner, based on their own experience, needs to help develop that to some extent. But the foundations of uh, vitamin C, and again, I'll get to the dosage in a second. Lysine, a minimum of a gram and a half a day. I've had people on as many as five grams a day. Um, and niacin of at least, you know, a gram to a gram and a half are the foundations to bring down that LP little a. Now, how much? Again, glad you asked, Mike. Um, Dr. Pauling himself usually said that most, most people living now require at least six grams of vitamin C a day. And people go, well, look, that seems like an awful lot. Well, remember, us and guinea pigs are really the only two animals on the planet that don't produce our own vitamin C endogenously. Um, our liver stopped producing it because when we were developing, we, we had a, a dietary source that was very rich in vitamin C. We didn't need to produce it. Um, unfortunately, guinea pigs still have the common sense to eat a high, high vitamin C rich diet. We, on the other hand, go toward things like Burger King and McDonald's, which bluntly don't have a lot of vitamin C. Um, <laughs> So because we are designed to have a huge vitamin C consumption but don't actually manage to, to bring it enough in, uh, through our diets, that's where we need so much supplementally coming in through, our, uh, through supplements. Um, 
Okay, so here's polling protocols. He says five grams. I've started seeing good effects at you know, somewhere between a gram and a half to three grams. Um, he was doing six grams a day at least of vitamin C, um, and he throws about 800 IUs of vitamin E on top of that. Um, Dr. Pauling himself consumed over 18 grams a day. Now, that dosage varies considerably from person to person. Um, there are some people for whom you can give them a, you know, 500 to 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, and that's about all they're going to manage. Uh, my exceptionally uh, sick patients, uh, people that I'm supporting who have Lyme disease, for example, or um, who have you know, extensive diabetes, um, I've gotten as many as you know, 25 or 30 grams a day into these people orally. Um, and if you have the ability, doctors, to actually do vitamin C intravenously in your states, um, I highly, su highly suggest looking into it. It's a phenomenal way to even boost that beyond it. Now, when I say a tolerance, um, basically they will get a little bit of loose stools. I don't mean in the hi, I visited Mexico style, you know, loose stools, but uh, certainly enough that it's beyond a normal, a normal bowel movement. So what I suggest for every patient, and this is their homework I give them on initial consultations, is go home and do a vitamin C loading test. Start off with 1,000 milligrams first thing in the morning. Do this on a day that you can stay home. You're not going to be out visiting around. Um, start off with 1,000 milligrams. An hour later, add 1,000 milligrams on top of that. So you're adding a gram an hour up to the point where they get a little bit, little bit of loose stools. Um, when they've reached that maximal dosage, I say usually back it off by uh, 500 milligrams or so just to give you a little bit of a buffer. Divide that by two, and that's your dosage. So say they topped out at 11 grams a day. Um, I'll back it down to, say, 10 grams, which means I'm giving them five grams morning and evening. Um, you will find that as they progress, um, particularly some, pe some people's tolerance actually goes up. They're able to tolerate more. Go ahead and push them. Um, other people, they will notice that after a while, their stools start loosening. This is actually a good sign. It means their vitamin C is becoming more under control, and as a consequence, their total, total amount goes down. You can actually measure their progress as they start being able to tolerate less and less. Um, most people I know end up toler uh, bottoming out somewhere between four to six grams a day. Um, we do have a question by one of the doctors I want to grab before I go too much further. Um, he says, will high-dose lysine outcompete arginine and reduce nitric oxide production, reducing the endothelial benefit of nitric oxide? Um, I haven't seen it's – it's a great question, Doc. Um, I haven't seen high doses of lysine outcompeting the arginine at that point, um, largely because the conversion of arginine over to – nitric oxide, the older you get, becomes less and less efficient anyway. Um, that convert, And so the doses that I'm using for lysine don't seem to have that much effect on nit nitric oxide to begin with. Um, if I'm, I'm addressing nitric oxide levels, and as I, if you're dealing with hypertension specifically, that is something you need to look into. Um, arginine is not usually a place that I'm going to run to because of some of the side effects. Um, if they've got various viruses, you can, you know, bring cold sores out of remission, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as I said, the efficacy of, of arginine, the older you get, is less efficient, to be, uh, the older you get anyway. Um, I found beetroot extract works extremely well to boost nitric oxide levels. Um, ornithine, um, ornithine actually works pretty well, as does citrulline. Um, and again, this is not a, a talk about nitric oxide, but you're absolutely right. There is that concern, but therapeutically I haven't seen it, and I haven't seen anything when I'm looking through the literature that shows that that's been an issue for anybody else. Good question, and certainly if you see it, let us know. Um, this, is, this is, after all, practice. It's only by our individual observations that we manage to get further down the road. All right. So getting back, um, what about veins? So we've talked a little bit our, about arteries. Now the fundamentals of using uh, using vitamin C and lysine um, boil over between both arteries and veins. Certainly you're going to see more immediate effects through the, to the architecture of the arteries themselves, but veins po pose a particular problem because veins do have some structural differences from arteries, um, and because of the differences in pressures, they have some different pathologies that tend to start cropping up with them because of their structural differences. Um, the big one here is predominantly um, the addition of the veins, uh, or excuse me, the, the valves um, in the inner layer. Now, these veins, uh, because there's not a large amount of pressure behind the, 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 the venous them, veins themselves, um, as you move around, as the, as, the blood, as the muscles underneath them pump, they help push the blood through these veins that allows them to move upwards against gravity back toward the heart. Um, the problem is that these veins, like all things, require good, uh, good nutritional support, and if they don't get the support they need, they start becoming a little less patent. They start having reflux. Blood ends up pooling around them, and what you end up getting is these tortuous varicosities that manifest in things like spider veins or varicose veins or hemorrhoids, um, any of these vascular 
regular irregularities. The fun part is is that the same uh, essential structure of the of the valves are also seen in a lot of lymphatic tissue and as a consequence a lot of the specialized things we use to address venous stasis are the same sort of approaches, approaches we're going to use to, to deal with lymphatic stasis. A good fundamental of this, and this is where we kind of branch off into some stuff that maybe you haven't heard of before, is hesperidin diosmin. Now, hesperidin is a natural thing that you'll find in most citrus fruits. Okay, It's a, a multi-ring structure. You can see the structure there off to the side. Um, there is a conversion derivative called diosmin. Okay? Um, now, usually a combination of the two in about a 90 to 10 mixture um, is actually more of, more of effective than either independently that I've seen. Certainly most of the data is done on a combination of the two. Um, but just realize you're talking about two very similar ring structures. One's just a, der a derivative of the other. Um, this diosmin, by the way, is a conversion. Um, it's a demethylation of hesperidin over into the diosmin form, as I pointed out here. Now, again, to kind of mention a clinical side note, because nothing is in a box, um, everything in the body is interlinked. The same pathways that the body uses to generate demethylation pathways are essentially the same methylation pathways that we deal with in other systems. Um, these methylation pathways can be difficult in some people um, or inhibited depending upon their, their genetic state toward methylation. Um, again, this is not going to be a talk on methylation pathways, but realize that if you've got some venous problems or some stasis issues, there may, and, and you correlate this with, say, some cardiovascular problems, with some uh, neurotransmitter issues, maybe some toxicity problems, you may be dealing with a methylation problem because that's the same biochemistry we're dealing with. Um, again, not going into that in great detail, if you haven't looked at things like methylfolate, um, MTHF, or um, uh, an extra strength methylfolate, and Zymogen again has some uh, phenomenal formulas for that, I strongly suggest you take a look at those. Um, if you're finding problems with hesperidin and diosmin, it may be a methylation problem that's, or a demethylation problem in this case, that's, that's causing part of the issue. Now, um, Interesting to note, a lot of people when we're dealing with vascular issues say, well, the conventional wisdom is to use things like rutin or troxorutin, another form of it, uh, to try to increase vascular integrity. And that's true. Um, but again, we're all kind of dipping out of the same well here. Um, one of the actions of hesperidin, for example, is to actually help produce um, rutinose, one of the uh, metabolic products off of, out of, off of rutin by hydrolysis. So again, we're kind of bumping up against the same pathways. Um, so and I've seen some people use troxorutin on top of a hesperidin diosmin mixture and get some good results. Diosmin seems to work for the most part by increasing the effects of norepinephrine. And again, I'm not going to go into gory detail about um, neurotransmitters, but realize that norepinephrine, as it increases the, the, the tone of the vascular wall, um, like all neurotransmitters, can be burned off. It's nice that we have something then, this, anti, this uh, antioxidant, that actually increases that venous tone by increasing the effect of that norepinephrine. Um, as the tone of the vasculature is increased, its sensibility goes down. And as it's able to hold its structure together closer and closer, even under lower pressures, you're going to have less likely that these tortuosities like spider veins or uh, um, uh, spider veins or, or um, any of the, uh, uh, excuse me, the distensions are, will get any worse. Um, diosmin also seems to reduce capillary hyperpermeability. That is, they're less likely to be leaky. Again, um, increases the tone of the lymphatic and the, and the uh, vascular wall. And it seems to improve uh, lymphatic drainage. So we're seeing similar effects in both venous tissue and in lymphatic tissue. Um, the upshot behind this, um, as we use vitamin C and lysine to kind of rebuild these collagen layers behind it. We reduce the, the, the leakage of the inner layer, this tunica intima, by the use of these high-dose uh, antioxidants, diosmin and hesperidin, uh, behind it. Um, a lot of the studies in the literature that have been done to, to back up diosmin and hesperidin um, are using a substance called Daflon 500. So when I mention this, don't, don't think I'm wandering a field. I'm, it's basically, it's the, it's the it's the form of this that a lot of the literature has been based on. And again, this is a 90 to 10 ratio mixture between diosmin, that, that derivative, and hesperidin. Part of me, and again, wonders why 
this ratio seems to be so important, and I think that goes back to um, probably the same methylation issues that I mentioned earlier. And there's a lot of data that that backs up using these to try to increase vascular tone. Um, they talk about the efficacy of double-blind placebo-controlled studies. Well, here's your here's your your golden standard right there uh, from '97, single-centered double-blind placebo-controlled study. Okay, there, guys, you've got it. Positive and protective effect of five study variables, including red cell aggregation, blood cell count, microcirculatory blood flux, amplitude, and the frequency of the vasomotion, okay? All showing improvements using this diosmin hesperidin mixture. Again, double-blind placebo-controlled study, six-week period, increasing capillary structure and health. Again, double-blind randomized study, 104 subjects, three months long, um, increased transcutaneous oxygen pressure and venous competence. Time and time again in the literature, we see a combination of these antioxidants doing well to increase the vascular integrity of both the venous and the lymphatic tissues. Um, here's a study from Laurent uh, back in 88, um, looking at chronic venous insufficiency in varicose veins. Um, the precursors, this uh, diosmin and hesperidin mixture versus placebo, 19% increase on, on placebo in one month. We're assuming that they're doing some kind of uh, lifestyle changes on top of this versus a 50% increase in the first month uh, for the people using the the antioxidants. Um, they managed to increase by 30, 36% by month two, but the people using the, anti, the, the antioxidants increased by 70%. And they're measuring things like feelings of heaviness, pain, night cramps, burnings, etc. All these things showing the venous stasis in the lower extremities. Same uh, same study also mentioned an, measured ankle edema. Um, the Hesperidin diosmin mixture, 86% improvement versus 45% on a placebo. Um, skin ulcers and discolorations, particularly those those uh, those ulcers that aren't aren't uh, aren't healing. 21% um, in, in, increase on placebo, 88% increase um, either disappearing or improving on uh, this mixture of diosmin and hesperidin. Again, lots of support in the literature using these these really novel antioxidants to try to increase venous tone overall. Um, here is another study from 93, double-blind placebo-controlled studies. I love this one because it's got a large number divided into two groups, um, and the study is just so, it's so black and white. 6% of the people in the control had managed to get their, their symptoms under control. The treated group, 73%. Um, and the great part about this is as opposed to using just vitamin C, which you've got to dose in these massive amounts, these are not huge dosages that they're using to actually get the effects, um, these effects in these patients. These are, are very small dosages uh, given twice a day. I'll get to those in just a second. Um, study from 94. Guys, I know this is, again, not a really great great topic, but again, you're going to run across one of these patients every day. You may or may not know it, <laughs> so make sure you're covering these things in your uh, initial intake, but ask them. There's a lot of people out there with hemorrhoids, whether it's related to vascular uh, vascular issues or maybe some uh, complications from pregnancy. Um, there's a lot of good evidence using um, Diavask for, for hemorrhoids. Double-blind placebo-controlled trial, 120 patients, 500 milligrams twice a day. Not very much at all over two months. Less pain, discharge, itching, bleeding, swelling, etc. Um, this is seen both in chronic effects and in short-term acute effects. Um, unfortunately, we don't have enough time tonight to go into to the studies that show the the acute attacks, but there are some really phenomenal studies showing the decrease in acute flare-ups of hemorrhoids um, using this di this uh, diosmin hesperidin mixture. Um, the great uh, there is also some evidence in the literature showing uh, that this is safe to give. Um, this is safe uh, safe to give to women during pregnancy. Um, based on a couple of studies, I believe, out of PNAS. Anyway, uh, if you're more interested in those studies, we can we can supply those uh, references for you. Just contact your, your provider, and all that information is out. Improve in, in hem, uh, hemorrhoids um, using the staph line 500. Again, blood cells tend to clump together. They reduce their clumping efficiency. Um, we've also seen decrease in the thickness or viscosity of the blood in diabetic patients. Again, a drop in the uh, inflammatory response. And again, we're dealing with only 500 milligrams. Um, to, in their case, they're using three times a day. I've seen effects in twice a day. Uh, when you're seeing inflammation in the cardiovascular system, when you're seeing uh, venous stasis, when you're seeing an increased viscosity, and particularly in those patients who, um, say, in a metabolic syndrome or a pre-diabetic syndrome or, or, or overt diabetics, um, and you're worried about that prothrombotic quality of their blood already, this shows has some this has some remarkable effects to try to decrease some of their symptomology. Um, 
because of the capillaries in, in kidneys. Um, it's lo it's logical to show a bleed over in, in some of the studies for, for kidney disease. Uh, Valency back in 1996, double blind placebo control study. I love throwing that out there. How many times, Doc, do you hear people saying, well, there's no evidence that backs that out? Here's their gold standard, double blind placebo controlled studies. 40 diabetic patients given 500 milligrams twice a day, okay? Placebo controlled a quarter percent increase, treated percent increase, 65 percent in overall filtration rates coming out of the kidneys. Um, again, because of the microvasculature in the kidneys, all those small capillaries, this is an ideal situation to deal with uh, supporting that underlying structure that helps with kidney function. Venous leg ulcers, um, Gilud 97, 107 patients, again, over a two-month period. Um, they were using standard compression, and I love watching these kind of, these kind of data. So here you have somebody with these horrible leg ulcers given this combination of diosmin and hesperidin. Over a two-month period, you have this unhealing ulcer and this diabetic eventually uh, healing up completely. Um, anytime you have these, uh, particularly these, these ulcers or these problems in the lower extremities, again, this, the, these antioxidant combinations do quite well to help them promote their growth along. Um, now, I will be completely honest. In most of these cases, it's rare. And again, docs, you're probably not doing this. You're doing this as well. I'm not going to give this patient just you know, diosmin and hesperidin mixture. I'm going to give them high dose vitamin C and, uh, and fish oils, get my omega 3s going. Um, I'm going to do some things to try to stimulate that skin growth, and there are varieties of ways you can do that. But so in a clinical setting, you're not going to do this as a standalone, but in the in the controlled studies you see here that are published, the effectiveness of this in trying to help your patients with these, these uh, chronic ulcers is really phenomenal into a more practical basis. And I want to kind of, before you work into that, let me kind of go another one of these disclaimers that's important for the lawyers that may be out there lurking. Uh, remember that we're talking about dietary supplements, um, that legally we can't say that these cure any disease, um, nor do they get rid of them. We're merely supporting normal function in the body, and these are not designed to replace drugs. However, the idea behind these guys is that we're helping the body reach a state of homeostasis. We are trying to get it back to a point where the body can heal itself. I, um, honestly, if you're saying that you're healing anything, you're you know, working a little bit beyond your scope. We don't heal anything. We help the body heal itself. And that's all we're trying to do is give the body the natural components it needs so that its natural healing mechanisms can kick in. So let's talk about some of the case studies and the clinical observations I've seen in our own practice here. Um, now, I, I operate in a, uh, a multidisciplinary wellness center here in Austin, Texas. Um, there are several of us here. We have naturopaths on staff. We've got an acupuncturist. We've got a couple of massage therapists. Um, my close partner is Dr. Jim Meyer. He's the doctor of pharmacy uh, down the hall. Um, I've never seen a guy who works harder to try to put himself out of business. Um, so a couple of these are, are pretty standard in our office, and there's a few. There's one at the end that I really want to point out to you that's really kind of amazing. Um, so here's a case study. Um, came in in the last two months or so. I've uh, been treating this patient for a while. Uh, for the most part, he's doing pretty well. Um, only recently did I find out that he, he, on conversation, he finally brought up that he'd had some some hemorrhoids. He's had a history of constipation. We've gotten that for the most part under control. His lower extremities had been cold. We gotten the thyroid balanced out. Um, but he finally mentioned that he's had these hemorrhoids for 20 years or more. Um, I described what a pain that must be, and no kidding, it really was. Um, so we started trying to get him treated for this. Uh, I was kind of amazed when uh, when I was asked to give this presentation because I, in our office, this is the standard of care. Um, so on testing, we found out he was gluten sensitive. Sure enough, we pulled him off gluten. Um, he's seeming improvement. Uh, the constipation seems to alle alleviate somewhat. We did put him on another uh, non-gluten based fiber to make sure that that, uh, that was working well. Um, everything else we tended to test tested, and this again after we got the, th the thyroid balanced out, everything else was was operating within um, ideally uh, within ideal limits, not just within normal limits. So put him on a gluten-free diet, gave him two grams of vitamin C twice a day. That's all we could manage to convince him to take. Put him on a gram of um, polycy polycyclic anthocyanins, which is basically another antioxidant on top of it. This is something that he had been taking for a, for a couple of months, so I don't think it made a, a big difference, but it was something that had been helping with him overall, so his antioxidant status was a little bit elevated. Um, gave him some probiotics to support what we're doing on the gluten-free diet, form of that diosmin hesperidin mixture twice a day. Came back a little while later. Two weeks later, he gives me a call and tells me that these hemorrhoids that he's had for 20 years are gone. I don't mean just better. I mean gone. Um, 
Suffice it to say, he comes in regularly and gets one of these, and he's doing you know one twice a day. He's tried go, going down to, I think he's tried going down to one a day once. Um, we haven't quite got him gotten him to the point that he's feeling good on it, but um, he seems to be doing quite well on one twice a day. Again, the hemorrhoids haven't made a comeback since I put him on the doc. And constipation is completely normalized within a month of putting him on this process, and the lower extremities improved. And we had kind of a a, a setback. I mean, we got him pretty well once we got his thyroid balanced out, but the lower extremities had still remained a little bit cooler than they should be. And understand, this is this is Central Texas, so when you have cold feet, um, it's not for a lack of heat here to try to offset it. Uh, thankfully, with the diavask, we're improving the vascular flow through the lower extremities, and we're starting to see um, we're starting to see the cold feet are starting to go away. Um, interesting side note on top of this, he's always had, um, his lower extremities have always been a little, a little less hairy. I mean, he's got fairly hairy arms, but his lower extremities have been fairly bereft of it. I'm also noticing, though I don't want to point it out to him quite as much, that when I give him his physical exam on follow-ups, um, that the hair on his lower extremities is actually coming back in uh, a lot more than it has been over the previous year or so. So he's, and this is again, a, a fairly fairly normal case in our office. Uh, we see on a regular basis, you come in with hemorrhoids, you're probably going to be put on vitamins and some diavask. Second case study, 52-year-old Caucasian female. Um, she came in, she's you know, getting getting up there and is not really happy with the idea. She can't wear this the skirts that she used to. Um, she's getting some varicose veins. Um, so they're starting to be a little uglier than they should be. And her angles are swelling. Now, part of this could be the fact that she had this she had a pre, uh, predisposition toward wearing high heels, but uh, she really didn't like the fact she couldn't wear her favorite shoes anymore. So, okay, so we'll work on it for a little bit. Um, we put her on some uh, on some exercise programs. Physical exam was pretty much unremarkable, um, other than the varicosities that are there. No, she didn't have any hemorrhoids or anything else that we found there. Blood pressure was normal, so I didn't worry about underlying cardiovascular issues, and most of her blood work appeared normal as well. Um, her diet was pretty normal, um, standard American diet. Uh, I was not terribly happy with that. She didn't manage to get enough exercise in. Um, she had been taking, taking a troxyrutin, one of, those, uh, one of those herbal derivatives for a while, but hadn't really seen a good result with it so far. Rather than try to fight her off of it, I merely said, let's supplement what we've got on top of it. So, patient was placed on a regular exercise regimen. Guys, get them up and moving if they're not exercising regularly, particularly with that venous stasis. And again, that side note, those veins um, the, va the, the valves in the veins work by the action of the muscles underneath them. If you've got a patient with venous stasis and they're not actively exercising to get those lower extremities moving, they're not pumping those, the, those muscles, they're not going to offset the damage that's being done. I'm not saying that they've got to go out and do power lifts, but they need to be doing something to try to get those, those lower extremities moving again. Um, so we put her on her exercise regimen. Told her to get up and move around regular. She had a desk job. Um, she seemed to do okay with that. Um, had her start wearing a little pedometer. Um, so she could start getting in a, and we started upping the number of steps I expected you were on every visit. Um, patient was placed on an anti-inflammatory diet. We pulled away the grains and the fruit, the, frame, the grains, the sugars, um, the artificial sweeteners, things like that. Put her on a vegetable-based diet with a lot of vegetables and fruits to try to natively increase that vitamin C. Um, and put her on some good protein sources, um, some chicken, some fish, things like that. Try to get her diet cleaned up a little bit. Um, Vitamin C loading test, so she had a maximal bowel tolerance at 8 grams per day, so I knew she needed a little bit more. Put her on 4 grams twice a day of that. Um, let, kept her on the standardized troxyrutin she was already doing twice a day. And again, just put on that diavask, that diosmin and hesperidin mixture, twice a day. Came in for a follow-up. Within two months, I saw a 50% visible reduction in the varicosities. Um, the edema, edema in the lower extremities was also doing pretty well. She had fit into the shoes she was so worried about. Um, she was very happy about that. And again, happy patients are, are good patients because they tend to refer. Um, but she was very happy, and you know, she was showing that the varicose veins had reduced. Um, uh, the combination of the vitamin C, the diavask, and the rutin. I talked about maybe bringing her off of it. She said. Absolutely not. She was going to stay on it. She continues to improve. It's been about four months down the road now. Um, we're showing some really uh, great improvements, and she's referred in a lot of patients, which is always nice for business. Um, the only thing I can say is that against my my orders, um, she's taken back to wearing shorter skirts. Um, not that she can't do it. I'm just going to say that <laughs> she should, uh, you know, maybe hold off a little bit. Give it, give it some time to kick in. Um, and again, remember that these are all these are all case studies. These are things that I've seen coming in and out of my office. That um, these are not anything that you know. You don't publish a paper on them. Um, and as individual practitioners, make sure that you're using your own uh, own best guess and uh, 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 clinical experience to weigh these against stuff you may read in the literature. Again, these are just my own clinical observations. All right. Now this is the fun one. Um, 
42-year-old Caucasian male walks into our office. Um, this actually was um, the the initial on this on this patient uh, was my partner, Dr. Jim Meyer, our PharmD here. Um, I've seen this patient a couple of times, and Dr. Jim was out of the office, so we've we we're kind of sharing this one at this point. Um, classic diabetes type two patient, um, having some major issues. Um, Obviously, there's multiple things going on with them. Elevated blood sugar, the A1C was about a 14. Um, they were showing vascular irregularities. They had bleeding um, uh, uh, bleeding in various places. The, uh, the kidneys were having some issues. Uh, the big issue that I want to bring note here is they had some retinal bleeding. Um, now, they had, this originally had brought up by their uh, ophthalmologist um, and, of course, not passing up the opportunity to kind of verify and take a look for myself. I popped out my ophthalmoscope. Docs, again, pop them out, use them on a regular basis. Um, sure enough, you can see the, the hemorrhages in the back of the, of the of the eye. He was, they had already started talking about trying to get him a, a seeing eye dog. His, um, his vision had started decreasing considerably. He was having some real problems trying to focus. Um, and the real, the real possibility was there this patient was going to lose their vision within the next couple of months. Um, obviously, we, we, were, we worked very quickly with this patient and dressed him from a multi, uh, multi, multifocal standpoint in conjunction with his conventional MDs. Um, we put him on a regular exercise regimen. We made sure he got good proteins and fats before and afterwards. Um, we loaded him up with a lot of DHA um, because that does quite well for retinal support, a lot of antioxidants. Put them on the paleo diet, no grains, no no dairy, nothing. Uh, very strict on that. For the retinopathy, like I said, we put them on a high dose DHA. Um, I put them on about 600 milligrams a day of the DHA itself. Uh, obviously, a lot of EPA on top of that because you, you very rarely find one that one without the other. Um, and I put them on Diavask one twice a day. Um, this was some really remarkable stuff. So the patient goes away, comes back a little while later, one month follow-up, he comes back in after seeing his ophthalmologist, blood sugar is under much better control than it was, um, his endocrinologist was very happy about that. Most notably, his um, when he went in to go get his vision checked again, he hadn't had any decrease in uh, vision ability, he actually started, uh, started to stabilize there. Looking in the back of his eye, his ophthalmologist noticed decreased uh, hemorrhages overall and the decreased retinal bleeding. The back of the retina seemed to be um, increasing, it seemed to be healing up quite nicely, and the patient's vision continues to improve. This is about six months out at this point. Um, the patient is, uh, they're no longer talking about giving him a seeing eye dog. His vision's improving. I'm not going to say that you know we saved him, but certainly I think we gave him some fundamental tools that the body then could try to heal itself. Um, this is really kind of like our one of our shining jewels here. You're going to see those patients with the the, the ulcers that don't heal uh, regularly. You're going to see those patients that have um, maybe some swelling in the lower extremity. You're going to see those diabetic patients. You're going to see um, the varicosities and certainly the hemorrhoids. Well, hopefully you're not seeing the hemorrhoids, but you know you're going to be seeing those patients that have the hemorrhoids. Um, the point though is that. When you see these cases, when you have these patients that walk in and say, look, I'm about to lose my vision, what can we do about it? And we see such market improvement in them. It really is the reason that we got into this kind of practice. Um, the patient is doing quite well, and we're looking forward to continuing to keep him on this diosmin hesperidin mixture. Okay, so to summarize, when I'm dealing with cardiovascular integrity, I start with the foundations that we use for all vascular tissue, whether it's arterial or venous. I start with a foundation of a high-dose vitamin C that I establish using a loading test. Um, I will mirror my increased dosage of lysine behind that um, with a minimum of, say, a gram and a half to three grams a day. Um, Dr. Pauling talked about as much as six grams a day, but again, that lysine dosage I vary considerably to kind of mirror what's going on with my vitamin C dosage. Um, we didn't mention it in the, in the slides, but again, when you're dealing with LP little a, that can sometimes be brought up because of that, niacin is kind of your go-to. The foundations of vitamin C and lysine, regardless, are good for both arterial and venous tissue. Uh, because of the changes in structure, the structural differences between veins and arteries, certainly the pressure differences, the addition of high-dose antioxidants and hesperidin and diosmin do quite well, and certainly I've shown you not only not only uh, scientific papers, but some good scientific uh, for some good clinical studies that have shown that this is basically a, 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 a this is a foundation for our vascular structure uh, support here in our clinic. All right. Fantastic, Dr. Victor. I learned so much, took a bunch of notes, and we have quite a few questions. Do you have time for a, a little Q&A? Sure. 
All right. So let's talk about interactions here with uh, patients that are on blood thinning medications, warfarin, and so forth. What's your typical approach or recommendations there? As always, I would say you need to be working with their with their providers first and foremost. If you are not a prescribing physician, um, make sure that you are above board in everything you're doing with their cardiologist who is prescribing these blood thinning agents. That being said, I've I've given massive doses of vitamin C and have not seen any any particular ill ill effects with the with the warfarin. If anything, some of the negative side effects, some of the uh, some of the, the the side effects that I've seen patients have with um, dosages of uh, increased dosages of warfarin, I, I see them go away as we increase their vitamin C. I don't think they're going to have any negative side effects. If anything, we're going to decrease their need for that warfarin overall. But again, as they go on, you're going to need to work with their cardiologist or their prescribing physician to make sure that their their blood levels remain the way that they're supposed to. Always make sure you're re- remeasuring, docs. Um, if you're concerned about it, put them on a put them on a test case for a little while, work with their physician, and retest them, particularly things like fibrinogen, um, ESR, SED rates. You know, their conventional blood uh, uh, blood workups for it uh, within about a month to a month and a half after putting them on uh, on initial dosages of these. Mm. Fantastic. All right, so let's talk about uh, for women that get hemorrhoids around their menstrual cycle. Any interactions here? Any suggestions above and beyond what we talked about today? Um, as we well, and that goes kind of beyond these th- this baseline, but. Um, I will use Diavask in this in this baseline protocol regardless. If they're having flare-ups around their menstrual cycle, this generally implies that we got hormonal imbalances too, which means for me that I want to start using not only a combination of anti-inflammatories, but things to try to reduce overall, say, estrogen dominance. Again, go back, when in doubt, test. Um, test, don't guess. When you test, you look brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it's and, and if you follow John Lee's work, he talks about the advantages of using salivary tests. There are a lot of people that um, still maintain that they prefer um, uh, uh, blood tests. Regardless of which way you go, make sure you've got a, a good consistent test base and you've actually got some good good data that substantiates what you're doing. That being said, if they got a flare-up around menses, generally, I've, in general cases, I've seen patients have uh, estrogen dominance in that case. Um, look at their progesterone levels. Maybe they're going to need some kind of a, a progesterone to balance that out. Um, Certainly, there's uh, what uh, Progensa, for example. There's a topical progesterone that does quite well that you can use to try to boost those up. Um, again, John Lee's work um, suggests that if you're doing topical progesterones, um, the salivary assays are really the superior way to be able to monitor those. Um, the other way to offset um, estrogen dominance that may be influencing um, hemorrhoid breakouts around uh, around menses uh, would be some kind of a diendyl methane and there are several good good ones on the on the market um, that diendyl methane um, is quite effective at, at kind of detoxifying and pulling those extra estrogens out of the body um, you got to dose it kind of heavily and yeah it is kind of expensive but you know what it's far better than the than the side effects that you're having of estrogen dominance um, one thing of clinical note guys if you haven't used diendyl methane before that dim um, when it starts pulling extra estrogens out of the body, you'll actually see in the urine turn a kind of mango color. Um, it's very important to let your patients know this uh, before you put them on it, um, because if they start having body bodily excretions turn funky technicolor colors, um, they'll come back to you and wonder if you broke something. So warn them ahead of time. They get kind of amused by it. Um, if you warn them otherwise, they get kind of worried. Um, again, dienyl methane is kind of a mainstay. The other thing that I'll say is that if you've got a patient that has got a history of estrogen-related issues, whether that's an estrogen-sensitive tumor or breast cancer or a family history of those or uh, PCOS or they've got uh, uh, uterine fibroids or breast uh, breast fibroids of some variety, your uh, that dienyl methane is going to be a great place to go, and it will work hand in hand with the vitamin C as an antioxidant. Yeah, perfect. And while you were talking uh, about the lymphatic system, I did some research in PubMed and so forth, and uh, had come across <laughs> some articles in the in the past, and and we forget about lymph in. I think in functional medicine, you know, we talk about the gut all day long, which I'm a huge fan of. We talk about the thyroid and brain and adrenals, but the lymph, there's so much research. I mean, this is where a lot of the dendritic cells and the T lymphocytes, where they hang out. So if you have lymph stasis, mm-hmm. you're going to, by default, have inflammation and dysfunctional immune signaling. And I think that's it. You, you highlighted on so many things, Victor. I really am grateful that 
we had you on. You did an excellent job. But in my opinion, that was one of the uh, – and the LP little a component that you talked about, which was awesome. But the lymphatic system, I think for people that are really trying to work with the immune system, and we know that every disease with itis or otis is inflammatory-based, uh, I think that's a huge area where you know something like a natural product like the diosmin hesperidin can really – help with just overall improvement of circulation and getting rid of stagnant blood flow and stagnant lymph. Well, so, and I'm glad you brought that up. There's an interesting side note to be made there. Um, remember when you talk about the structure of the gut, um, a, good, a good component of your immune system exists in the malt and gut tissue, the gut-associated lymphoid tissue that's tied up in your intestines as well. So when, a lot of times when we're dealing with um, gut integrity and gut issues, we forget that essential component. We talk about, um, you know, f flow of blood from the from the liver to the intestines and back again. We talk about, um, you know, the the absorptive capacities. We often forget that that lymphatic support is an essential part of it. Now, unfortunately, when I'm do when I'm doing my research uh, for this talk, I what I can't find right now are any good studies that actually show that actually correlate um, increased gut function or increased um, malt or gall tissue function in relation of using this diosmin hesperidin mixture. Um, now, as science progresses, hopefully we're going to have somebody that will run those kind of studies, but at least in overall theory, I can see, um, because this supports um, lymphatic tissue, um, I can see if we're having some congestion in the in the multi gall tissue of the, of the intestine, this actually having some effect. Again, that's nothing that I've seen so far and nothing that I've found in the literature, but it's going to be interesting. And docs out there, if you happen to find, you know, if you happen to be the guy that, that does a good study on this or has a good case study, please let us know. We'd love to be able to, to share this with the rest of the community. Absolutely. And that brings up another point, too, is there's a higher prevalence of gastroparesis and, and reduced GI motility in individuals that are overweight or pre-diabetic and so on. So, you know, overall, just improving, you know, gut motility. And then also here we're talking about the lymphatic system and the, and the blood you know, vascular system, which is huge. And you also hit on something I think a lot of practitioners are starting to recognize but haven't really looked at and that increased blood viscosity. So I think that's, a, you know, we just did a podcast on uh, Stitcher Radio and iTunes with uh, Ralph Holsworth. So if you just go into to Google, type in Stitcher, S-T-I-T-C-H-E-R, and blood viscosity, you'll pull that up. But do you want to talk about that? that? That study that you mentioned that was coming out of Europe that showed a reduction in blood viscosity with these two polyphenol compounds is so critical yeah. and big. Do you want to talk about that anymore? Um, well, <laughs> we've got a lot of time for it, but um, these in particular, like I said, I, I think they will decrease the blood viscosity. Um, when it comes to blood viscosity, though, I... I'll be honest, I very rarely will use just this product alone. Again, the combination of this along with your omega-3 fatty acids along with the turmeric or resveratrol and certainly the studies showing combinations of the turmeric, resveratrol, green tea 